Hi to everyone tuning in on Zoom and Facebook, and welcome back to Rabble's Off the Hill political panel. I'm Robin Brown, co-host of tonight's panel, and I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I'm joined tonight by my regular co-host, Libby Davies. Well, thanks very much, Robin. And I'm Libby Davies, and I'm your co-host as well for this month's Off the Hill. And I'm joining you from the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Coast Salish peoples. Thanks, Libby. Well, Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day and Indigenous History Month, and in honor of that, for this month's Off the Hill panel, we wanted to dig into the issues most affecting Indigenous peoples' lives across Turtle Islands. So to do so, we welcomed a group of Indigenous leaders to join our panel. First, uh, welcome to Joan Phillip. Joan is a respected community leader and Indigenous elder who has dedicated her life to fighting for social justice, human rights, and climate action. Her work experience includes being a youth counselor at Britannia School, program director at the Aboriginal Friendship Center, and lands manager for the Penticton Indian Band. Currently, Joan is running in a by-election for the BC legislature, and we appreciate you taking your time from your busy campaign to join us today, Joan. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome also to Melanie Mark. Melanie served as the British Columbia MLA for Vancouver Mount Pleasant from 2016 to 2023. She was the first First Nations woman elected to the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia and the first First Nations woman to serve in the Cabinet of British Columbia. Melanie is Nizga Gitson Cree and Ojibwe. Welcome, Melanie. And rounding out our panel uh, tonight is Rachel Snow. Rachel is uh, Iahe Ia Nakoda and the daughter of the late Reverend Dr. Uh, Chief John Snow. She holds a Juris Doctor from the College of Law, University of Saskatchewan, and is an outspoken educator, speaker, writer, and co-contact person for the Indigenous Activist Networks. Rachel resides on our ancestral lands of Mini Sneed, which is west of Calgary, Alberta. And Rachel is also a columnist for Rabble. Welcome, Rachel. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists tonight, and a special welcome to all who are watching on Zoom. We encourage you to participate in the chat and polls and to ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function, and we'll do our best, as always, to address your questions. For those of you watching on Facebook, a reminder that if you'd like to participate in future events, simply sign up to Rabble's free newsletter to get a notification for the Zoom invite. Just go to rabble.ca slash subscribe. Okay, well, thanks very much, Robin. And as you mentioned, today's panel will be informed by National Indigenous Peoples Day. And, you know, many people want to see reconciliation, but reconciliation, but the question I think we want to zero in on today is are they willing, are we all willing to hear the truth first? So let's dive into that. And we're gonna begin with you, Melanie. I, I see that you're muted, so you might want to unmute yourself. Um, we're hoping, Melanie, that you might share your reflections today on National Indigenous Peoples Day, particularly on your journey as an elected representative since 2016, including as a cabinet minister in the BC legislature. And I had the pleasure of, of um, working with you a little bit as a cabinet minister, and it, it was always a wonderful experience to, to work with you. But we know it was not always easy. And you've said that, you've shared some hard truths about your experience as an Indigenous woman in government. And on this particular day, where we are talking about truth before reconciliation, I, I guess I want to ask you, do you feel that having put yourself out on the line is making a difference? It was a very hard thing to do, I'm sure. And how, you know, how has that feel? How has it felt to you? Has it, has it made a difference? Well, <clears throat> it's great to see you, Libby, and great to uh, be joined by everyone across Turtle Island. I'm participating from the traditional territory, the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations people. I have a picture here of you, Libby. Uh, you were by my side when I ran in the by-election. And uh, there's a lot to unpack to your question. I, I think mm -hmm. first, when I think about today, I think about my grandparents. I think about the hell that they went through to survive. I think about um, how, prosper how prosperous they were in the villages of Lakalzap and Gitamax 
and my grandparents on my dad's side up in the Pequot First Nation, um, how, how we were thriving as Indigenous people and how colonizers came in and ripped that apart. And it wasn't too long ago. So I think the truth part is, I think there are many people in our society that want to get on with it as mm -hmm. though that was yesterday and to move on. And there's an impatience um, to, to move on with the past, but you can't get to reconciliation without understanding the truth. And the truth is, um, I don't speak my language because it was beaten out of my grandparents. Um, many Indigenous people were taken from their families to the 60s scoop. Um, there, there's so much to unpack, but I think when I reflect on today, I think about education, I think about Murray Sinclair, Justice Sinclair, who told us that education got us into this mess and it's going to get us out. Um, I think about how I struggled so much in my life as an urban Indigenous person to go through all of these colonial institutions, making my way through six different high schools and all of the pieces that that there's so many levels of oppression for people like me to not thrive and to not um, to make it through these systems. And so there's a lot on my mind today. I, I think about the kids in care. I think about people that are incarcerated. I think about the systems that have kept us down. And I think about my daughters today. I think about the fact that I'm still standing because my grandparents fought for me to be here. They sacrificed, they endured major oppression and disconnect, um, stolen from their culture and those thriving nations where we come from. And so the fact that I made my way into politics uh, is really beyond me. Um, I don't, I, I didn't choose a life of politics. I believe I was, have been training my whole life uh, to be an advocate for our people, that I've been entrenching systems my entire life. I always made people uncomfortable with the truth. I have no discomfort making people uncomfortable to hear the truth about the conditions of Indigenous people on our stolen land. And so was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. Um, but there are many days that I made big changes that I'm incredibly proud of. I made that change because people had my back. I made that change because there was a call to action for, for things like the first Indigenous law school at UVic, which was Article 50 of the TRC, or Article 16 to have a language fluency degree. There are so many things that my eagle feathers touched uh, by way of being a politician, and I did my level best to be an advocate for our people, and I will continue, and I hope that more Indigenous people like Joan Phillip and other um, First Nations matriarchs go into those institutions and make people uncomfortable about the things that we need to change, and that we start to bring that social, environmental, and economic justice back to our communities, because it is our, our God-given right it is our self-determination. And I think that Canadians need to stop being so sensitive about, um, I think there's, there's a sensitivity out there about this guilt that people are expecting us to get over. I don't need to get over the guilt of what happened. I, I accept the fact that I don't speak my language, but allies need to start stepping up to the plate and realize that they need to start paddling with Indigenous people across Turtle Island to bring back that prosperity and those thriving nations that I believe Joan will probably speak about uh, in, in her grandfather's eyes. My grandparents sacrificed so that I would have a better life. And as I close, I just think about my daughters today. And my daughter just graduated from BCIT yesterday um, as the only one, and she wore her regalia. But when we think about being the only one, uh, we really have to start to take stock of that. How many, how many white people say, oh, wow, there's only one white person that graduated today? How many black people say, wow, there's only one black person that graduated today? There's only one Chinese person that graduated today? There's only one South Asian person? Like we really have to start doing the math and uh, those truths make people uncomfortable. They, they, they resonate this feeling of discomfort, like, oh, Melanie, why do you have to be so profound? Because it's all about math. It's our land. And we need to start seeing our Indigenous people thriving, not in jails, not in foster care, not as murdered missing Indigenous women, not seeing our land 
um, exploited, but to start really bringing that balance back into our society. Well, thanks for that, Melanie. And I, I have to say, I've always very much respected your ability and willingness to speak out about the truth and to bring people with you. And listening to you today, as you reflect on National um, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, you know, there is a lot to unpack. And one of the things that you touched on briefly was, was the sort of the institutional side, right? Um, whether it's like going through school, but you've had this experience in government, not only as a, an elected member, but also as a cabinet minister. Um, and I think, I think those places are really hard because they're so, uh, the foundation of them is so much a part of the sort of the colonial history of, of Canada, right? And the sort of the British parliamentary system and how it plays out. And, um, and I mean, I'm just wondering how you're sort of recovering from that experience now that you've left the legend. Joan hopefully is about to go in and pick up the torch. Um, but well, any, there, any, because you did speak out about your experience there and it, it was, I think it was hard for people to hear, but it, boy, it sure needed to be heard. Yeah, I, I think that we have to stop being apologetic about the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, when I made my speech on February 22nd, 2023, about being in the torture chamber, those institutions and the institutions are across lots of different spaces where there's roll eye rolling and there's a sense of here she goes again. Mm -hmm. Here she goes, we have to hear the truth. Yeah, we have to hear the truth. There, we live in a very transactional society. Here's your 10 minutes. We did our ho ho, let's acknowledge the land. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be insulting, but really let's think about that. Really let's start understanding what the protocol means. Stolen land, unceded territory that indigenous people have been fighting for in the courts and we're winning. We're gonna to continue to win because indigenous people are infiltrating those systems. So my pride is infiltrating those systems. I went to university because indigenous people couldn't go to university. I ran to be elected because indigenous people didn't even have a right to vote not too long ago. And to be able to have a seat at the table was a great honor. I, I'm so thankful, really sincerely from the bottom of my heart that John Horgan gave me the assignment to be the advanced education skills and training minister so that I could bring that social justice for people. Um, but I was often tokenized and seen as Melanie only cares about Indigenous people. That's racist to think that, so any other cultural group only cares about their cultural background. I was an elected official for the entire province. And I did that for my people, Indigenous people, as well as British Columbians alike. So I, I it was, not easy, but being outspoken comes easy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, my ADHD and my big energy is something that makes people uncomfortable because I think there's an urgency. I think there's an urgency to fight for our climate. I think there's an urgency to fight for our families and our children, our, ed our education. And I think there's this apathy. I think there are people that think we've got all day and we don't. We need to start mm -hmm. hustling and start moving. So the truth of the matter is we have a roadmap through the TRC mm -hmm. and through UNDRIP to get things done. And why I left politics was because things weren't moving quickly enough and that change wasn't happening to get the results that we need with the sacrifice that I was leaving at home with my daughters. And my daughters get one chance at having a childhood and I wasn't going to um, make them endure any more sacrifices without the courage and the guts to make change. So I'm gonna say one last quote. Grand Chief Stuart Phillip told me when I first got elected, reconciliation isn't for wimps. And that goes back to the truth of the matter. Do we have to have the guts to really have these hard conversations? Are we really willing to move the dial and see Indigenous people not um, homeless, entrenched in encampments, dying from opioid crises? Like, I think there's uh, uh, a numbness that society has. Okay, well, it's just another dead Indian. That's not how I see it. And I hope that more people start to see that there's an urgency to see our, our lives um, are worth living. Yeah, well, I, I have to say, Melanie, you come from a fine tradition of being outspoken from East Vancouver 
So uh, moving moving over to Joan now, who has also got um, just an incredible history. Um, Joan, you're you're a very trusted member, matriarch, really, of the community, not only in terms of East Vancouver, but the Indigenous community, the community of activists and people who fight for social justice. And I know you've dedicated your life for social justice and the rights of Indigenous people. So it's really um, quite amazing to see you step up to continue the path uh, that was begun by Melanie for Indigenous leadership in electoral politics. It's, um, yeah, it has its ups and downs, that's for sure. And as, as noted by Robin, you're currently running in a by-election, so we very much appreciate you taking time out from a busy by-election, and it's been a great by-election, uh, to be with us today on uh, Off the Hill. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to sort of put, it's a fairly open question, because I just want you to speak what you want to speak. And that is, what are the key issues that you identify as being necessary for reconciliation, both in BC, but also across the country? I want to start by uh, thanking my relatives, my Coast Salish relatives, the Salalwatu, Musqueam and Squamish, for the opportunity to, to um, share with you today. I want to, secondly, I just want to uh, thank Melanie Mark for, for preparing the ground. And I, I, uh, I liken Melanie to like a, a grass dancer. Grass dancers and their function is to, to be the first ones out there to trample down the grass and make it easier for the other dancers getting out there. So I, I really feel like you're the grass dancer having pounded down that grass. Because I'm telling you, I've watched some of the um, antics at the uh, in the legislature and it's it, it's pretty shocking and I think I think they all need to you know just grow up um, in terms of the issues that uh, we're going to be addressing there's uh, issues that uh, have been raised on the doorstep during my door knocking and they're basic bread and butter things like uh, you know, health care and uh, affordable housing and, and that kind of thing. But for Indigenous peoples, uh, the truth has to be number one. And it's not just enough for Canada and, and the, uh, British Columbia to, to issue a nice a packaged apology. It has to be made right. They have to make it right. And I would like to see us um, meet with the local uh, nations and pull them together and ask them, how can we make it right? Because really it's the, we've been so victimized and it's the victim that needs to say, this is how you're going to do it. This is what we need from you in order to feel right. So um, we really need to sit down with the nations. We need to sit down with, uh, we got those 94 calls to action and that needs to be implemented. Uh, British Columbia has adopted the, the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and, and British Columbia has an action plan. I want to get into the legislature and start push, push, push. Mm. Well, I'm, I know you will because that's what you've always done, Joan, but um, it, it's also a lot of groundwork, right? Um, because it's partly uh, an internal discussion, as you say, pulling people yeah. together, pulling local nations together and saying it has to be made right. And I'm sure there's many different perspectives within those communities about what it is that has to be made right or maybe you know what the priorities are what's the order you know what are the top three um so i i think when melanie was saying you know that people want stuff done in like 10 minutes or you know you you, you do that it, it it does become very token but the but the process 
of bringing people together is really, really important so that it is done right, not only to do right, but that it's actually done properly. And, uh, and I, I just wonder, um, do you feel you have the support to do that both in the political community that you're part of and also in the indigenous community? Because that, that's a lot to take on. Uh, yes, I do. And it, it's not like I'm uh, running where I'm a completely unknown entity. Uh, when I got asked to run by the party, people know who I am. They know I'm, I'm going to, to stand up and speak up. Uh, and they know I'm going to stand by my principles no matter what, like, uh, like Melanie Mark. Um, um, being not forceful, but definitely firm. Uh, and same with the uh, general public. They, they already know who I am. I am. They can Google me and all these things pop up. So I'm not an unknown entity and they're gonna get what they wish for. And I think that they know um, who I am and they know that I'm going to push, push, push. Mm -hmm. Okay. Prepared for that. It's good. Thanks, Joan. Yes. You know, I also think of my grandfather, you know, when I when he did the lament. It just wasn't a lament. It was um it was hopeful. It was it was um he knew that we were he wanted us to pick up the tools of of uh, the white man's success and and um become the strongest and the, and the best uh, segment of society. So in a sense, um, Melanie and um, Rachel were all his dream come true because we're fulfilling his hopes and dreams. I see that Brianne has posted the lament in the chat. And for those of you who are listening in today, please take a look at it. It's incredibly powerful to see Chief Dan George um, give his lament at Empire Stadium from 1967, which was Canada's 100th, the centennial. So it's a, it's a very powerful piece. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Joan and Melanie, a powerful opening to our panel. Um, uh, Rachel, we're gonna bring you in now. Um, Last September, you wrote a rabble column titled First Nation Indigenous Truths Before Reconciliation Talk. What were you arguing in that article? And is anything different today that's changed your mind? Um, uh, I'm stage, uh, the Grinch all my relations. Uh, before I begin, I want to say that uh, when we I think I'm going to offer a different perspective uh, than the two previous speakers because I always go back to when we talk about uh, truth and reconciliation, we do have to start with the truth. And the truth is that there are differences in the First Nations across Canada and that Canada does not even know this, that we are still explaining this at, the, at various ground levels. Uh, when you talked about the, the column that I wrote, I think all of the columns I have written um, point to the fact that Canada has not taken the time to truly understand First Nation people. Because if Canada truly understood First Nation people, then we wouldn't be having the issues that we're having that still exist today. And no, nothing has changed. Um, it doesn't matter if we play in their system because we are um, tokenized. We're, we're given uh, positions, but we're given very careful parameters that we have to follow. And so it's not really a voice that we're given, more or less, you know, we're puppets in that system. We're not allowed uh, to make the changes that we have to make. The first and foremost um, help that we as Indigenous or as First Nation, Iyahi, Nakoda, Haudenosaunee, uh, Nehiao people, the things that we come from or that we have first is our spirituality our agreement with the creator are being placed on this land to safeguard and to steward 
um, all the things, all of creation that is here. That's the most important part of who we are as a people. And that spirituality does not come across because Canada and the Canadian system measures things in terms of material or capitalist success. They do not measure things in terms of the things that were valuable to our people. I think my ancestors, the uh, absolute treaty um, and the true governance people who were in place, who wanted life for us when they negotiated, they wanted to have, they wanted to make sure that the coming generations would continue to exist, that we'd have homes like our teepees, that we'd have, you know, fires or warmth, that we'd be able to hunt and provide for our families, that we'd have, we beside clean waters and rivers. They wanted to make sure that when they agreed to share the land with Canada, that the settlers, the newcomers coming in, understood that nothing was to change. And Canada was uh, completely, um, Canada was uh, duplicit. They were uh, drafting the Indian Act in 1876, even as they were signing uh, Treaty Number Six in 1876. The treaty area I'm from, Treaty Number Seven, was signed in 1877. So Canada had already started uh, a racist piece of legislation that was going to be telling our people what they could do with the past system, with, with the um, enfranchisement, if you worked uh, off reserve or if you uh, went to school, uh, if you left the reserve, these kinds of things, enfranchisement means that you're no longer a treaty Indian or a status Indian, but that you're uh, just a regular Canadian citizen. So there were things that were happening in our lives that, um, there were things that were happening in our lives based on what Canada was doing. And this has been brought up, there were reports, there's been information from Peter Bryce, who uh, Cindy Blackstock often quotes about the residential school and the illness of children in those schools. There have been whistleblowers. There was a Hawthorne report. Trudeau still, Trudeau the elder, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, still went ahead and pushed out that white paper because he wanted to cease for First Nations to have what he called special rights. We don't have special rights. We have special obligations. We have obligations to the land. We have obligations to our ancestors. We have obligations to all of creation. That's what we're doing. That's what we're holding on to. And at no point, I think in the entire time that I grew up learning um, from a hereditary chief and elder learning about uh, the traditional teachings, learning about the values of my people. At no time did I ever feel that I was coming from a place where I was not empowered. I've always thought that being a First Nation, an Indian, a Native person was the greatest thing that I could be. I don't measure myself according to mainstream standards. The measurement of who I am is in my children or my grandchildren being able to pray in the language. The measurement of who I am is my sons or my daughters dancing in the sun dance or being able to sing those traditional songs. That is what we talk about when we're talking about a truth before reconciliation. It's great to talk about it, but to live it is difficult, especially in this day and age. And no, that, uh, that understanding of who my people are is not coming across. Even today, or even when I'm a panelist, I don't have access to good Wi-Fi. We don't have good infrastructure, good roads on the reserve. These are things regular Canadians just don't know about. They think it's very easy for us to go down to Starbucks and you know just load up your Wi-Fi. Well, there aren't any Starbucks you know, in our reserve. Within 20, 25 miles, we have our 20, 25 minutes, we have to, at least, we have to go away from our reserve in order to access some of the benefits that everyday Canadians take for, for granted. So if we want to have truth, then we have to know the truth, all of the truth. We have to understand that um, the, the circumstances for First Nation people are different and that we, um, uh, that we, are, we are not able to, um, we are not able to um, uh, all, you know, fit nicely into legislation or one bill. And I I've said this before, I completely oppose the UNDRIP. 
We opposed the UNDRIP because the UNDRIP was taken in 2007, and we talked about it briefly um, before in the, um, in the uh, chat, just before. We talked about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that uh, was not accepted by Canada, the US, New Zealand, and Australia. But these Western states did add Section 46 into the United Nations Declaration. And that the, the um, our Article 46 basically says we can challenge the territoriality of any of the states, which gives Canada a veto, which gives Canada the trump card. So we, as Treaty First Nations who signed the international documents with the Imperial Crown, with Great Britain, we've carefully guarded our treaty position because that's the nation to nation relationship. That's why Canada exists. But Trudeau, uh, the junior Trudeau now, we, we uh, heard just this past week that Trudeau was planning to repeal the Indian Act. He was planning to um, uh, do something again, um, just uh, without consent, without uh, any kind of consultation. He was gonna do this in our best interest. Uh, he had done this before February 14th, following the incident with Colton Bushy up in uh, North Battleford. He announced his great framework that was gonna bring everybody together and was gonna be uh, the liberal Kumbaya plan, but the First Nations opposed it. it. But it was the activists, the grassroots people on the ground, uh, the remnants of the uh, hereditary chiefs, those of us who were born and raised in treaty, those of us who were born and raised uh, around our, our communities, on our reserves, in our spiritual places, in our languages, those of us who know those things, we were the ones who stood in 1969, it was hereditary chiefs primarily. And now we have uh, a completely different situation in uh, 2023. And to me, it's not only upsetting and frightening, it's uh, completely a slap in the face to my ancestors who did uh, fight and die on this land so that uh, we could continue to be the people that we would be, so that we could continue to be able to do hides in the summertime, so that you know there's a pavo in my community, so that my grandchildren could dance. There's things that are happening. Oh, and uh, the grass dance is a, uh, it's more, it's uh, comes from the uh, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people, and it's more of a ceremonial dance than just a, a clearing of grass. It's uh, if I didn't say something, uh, my ancestors and my my uh, relatives um, from the other Suian tribes would say something because we have to make sure that when we're speaking of something, uh, especially if it is that we don't do the pan indigenous discussion, that we know the origins, that we know the truth behind this, because if we don't know the truth, then we have to take the ceremonial things, prayers, time, energy, space uh, to learn so that we can properly represent our people so that when we are negotiating and we put our voice out there, that they have all the information, that they don't just have um, the information that they wanna hear, but they have the information that is the information that derails them. Because uh, right now, Canada, uh, Trudeau was planning to relate releases under the U UN Declaration Bill C-15, where he has taken all of uh, the treaties. He's putting us into his self-government frameworks. He's uh, repealing the treaty, uh, the Indian Act, and uh, tearing that all apart. Uh, the things that he is doing um, are, if we don't even know uh, who our First Nation people are, how can you go ahead and start making plans or start doing making actions that are actually gonna be harmful and without our consent and without our, um, without our own people's knowledge. Our own people don't have treaty history. Our own people don't have uh, the knowledge. Uh, they have been colonized and broken into so many pieces. So today uh, we actually put out press releases and information saying that uh, Trudeau was gonna make this announcement. Hmm. Well, yeah, um, I, I'm going to move on to the next question because I think it's very related to what each of you have been saying, and that is this question of truth. And it's true there are there are different perspectives about 
you know, people's experience and uh, uh, in different places across the country. I mean, that's part of truth. But I guess what I want to um, draw our attention to is the media also plays a very big role in the perceptions and portrayal of truth and falsities. Uh, the media often try to rewrite and sometimes even omit Canada's racist colonial history. So I would love if each of you could um, just to hear your assessment of your experience with mainstream media and the role that it plays in truth and reconciliation. Uh, and specifically to think about has the coverage improved in mainstream media with better analysis and truth, or is it just a question of window dressing that we're, that we, that we're continuing to see? So um, Melanie, maybe we could begin with you just in terms of you know, some reflections or observations about how you see the role of the media in terms of truth before reconciliation or and reconciliation. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I want to maybe just build off of a little bit of what Rachel was saying, and I, I think there's mm -hmm. an important truth to being able to share that many of us don't know our culture for a reason. I mean, it was stolen from us, or there's a, whole, there's a variety of reasons, especially depending on the generation that you're living through right now. Like I'm the sixth generation. We talk about the seven generations. We have so many different protocols. There's so much complexity in our, our governance in the way of our being that it's simplified to a soundbite. And so I just want to acknowledge that for what Rachel is explaining. I'm Niska Gitsan Cree in Ojibwe. People say, oh, well, so you're just all pan-Canadian or whatever the, the summarizing of it is. And it diminishes my Niska Gitsan Cree Ojibwe distinct nations and their culture and customs. The media are not trained. They're not just like any other systems. There's minimal training. I don't know what, what modules or what hours the media are trained in uh, understanding t the TRC, but even the TRC, it doesn't, you don't have to have a degree or PhD to read the TRC. You can be in kindergarten, it doesn't matter what institution, and I don't wanna get into debates on how and where, but it's 94 calls to action, it's not complicated. It, it's a call to action from survivors of the residential school. And in there, articles 84 to 86 talk about more training, more exposure to not only negative stories. It is National Indigenous Day today. And when we talk about people want to, hey, you know, let's, let's talk about our culture. Well, some of us, I don't have my culture. My grandparents aren't here. Let's have a real conversation about why my grandparents didn't teach me my language. Right. So these are hard truths. They're triggering for Indigenous people. But the media want us to come to the table with your regalia. Do you know how many interviews I've had where people are like, can you bring your regalia? Not understanding the protocols that you don't just dance around in your regalia. You wouldn't go up to some other culture and say, hey, can you bring this ceremonial thing and dance around and parade around? So it's insulting. The media can be insulting. As a politician, it was demeaning. <laughs> half the time about the work that I did or didn't do that wasn't reflected in the soundbite. That's not anger. This isn't me saying anything more than the truth. I did the work and what got reflected in the six o'clock soundbite was some dumb Indian. And I've said that in the record in the past. The media portray, their goal is to have the gotcha moment. The sensationalism, the capitalism that drives this the headlines of boondoggles or whatever oppositions are trying to characterize for politicians. That's the parliamentary system that you spoke about earlier, Libby, uh, mm -hmm. for people like me that were in that arena. But as an Indigenous person, I listen to the radio and half the time all I hear about is Indigenous people dying from overdose, fighting for our land, roadblocks, and kids in care. There's way more to Indigenous people than that narrative. And so it's it's a cheap narrative. It's a lazy narrative. It's an ignorant narrative. And Indigenous people don't have the capacity to keep lifting up non-Indigenous people and, and educating them on our customs and protocols. And going back to what Rachel was saying, I, I can't speak to some other nation's protocol. I, I'm trying to reclaim my own understanding of my own protocols and customs. And so... I, I want to pause there because I was in a unique position as a, an MLA who had to represent 
the crown at the provincial level as though I'm the ambassador for all Indigenous people in this province. Like, it's impossible to have that understanding. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a long way to go on building up that competency. But on Indigenous Day, I think just asking the public to have an understanding, that's it's exhausting. It's mm -hmm. exhausting to go out there and think about, well, think about your grandparents. Well, which ones? The one who ran away from the Indian agents or the one who got beaten at St. Michael's or, you know, like th these are not really fun stories to share. So the fact that my hashtag is still here, I take a moment right now and I wish that the media would take a moment to acknowledge that we've survived the levels of hate and genocide that has happened to our people and really acknowledge that when I talk about my one daughter who crossed the finish line amongst 200 students, we're swimming so hard to cross finish lines and what, whatever that finish line is for people, that, that's your own journey, that's your own call to action. Um, but I think there's still a long way to go around the tokenism and the racism. Mm -hmm. And Joan, anything that you would like to add in terms of um, your your observations about the role of the media and what, what they do or don't do? I guess it's mainly what they haven't done. Um, uh, even just telling half the truth is not, um, or not telling the whole truth is a lie. You can't omit anything and you can't start uh, reconciling uh, with no foundation for what, what had happened and what the truth is. In British Columbia, we've got 29 specific nations of people, indigenous peoples here. So at the, um, and when I went to the interior, the us coastal people, we're Longhouse people, and we go up to the interior, we're, we're as different as chalk and cheese. I may as well have been in a foreign country. So it's, there's no easy fix, but they have to start from the truth is, not only were we colonized, we still are colonized, and the media does have a role to play. The thing that really helps now is um, rabble because you're, uh, you're not mainstream, you're not afraid to tell the truth. And what I'm hoping is that it'll compel mainstream media to actually put the truth out there, throw it on the table, let's look at it, you know, it, whether it's ugly or not ugly. And that way we can at, at least have a starting point towards reconciliation. And so I'm, I'm really thankful for mediums like Rabble and, and uh, all those, even though I don't believe everything I hear on Facebook, at least it's um, throwing things out there that people actually have to look at. I recall uh, in 1990, people were, the um, citizens were saying, what in the world was that? What happened there? Well, it was, they finally got faced with the truth. And the same with uh, what happened in, um, in Kamloops when they, they discovered those hidden, children, um, buried children, a school with a cemetery. Well, people were wondering what in the world that allows us the opportunity to say, okay, let's, let's talk about the truth here. The truth is no school should have a cemetery. The truth is they did have one. The only and even in Kamloops, they only recorded 50 children that were buried. Well, there was 215, that's 165 short of what was recorded. So in order for things to, to be made right, and um, 
I've been used as a token before, but I tell you, it doesn't mean that I stop saying what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna stop challenging um, the status quo and the media and so on. And I won't, um, I, I won't stop telling the truth in the legislature if I get elected. Mm. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah. I'll turn it back to you, Robin. Uh, thanks, Libby. Um, yeah, I want to switch over to the coast to coast. As we all know, Canada has been battling an unprecedented number of wildfires this year, and the problem, scientists say, will only get worse. So and this is a question to everybody. Um, what does it say about Canada's relationship with Indigenous communities that we are celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day while much of the country is on fire? Let's start with Rachel. Uh, I repeat that, sorry. Uh, the question was, um, what, did it, what did it say about Canada's relationship with Indigenous communities that we are celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day while much of the cu country is on fire? Okay. I think that's uh, the perfect way to sum up National Indigenous Peoples Day because not only uh, as, as I'm speaking about our responsibilities as Indigenous people to protect and steward the land. Because of the colonization, yes, I agree, we have forgotten what our responsibilities are. And so when we go forward, we're not uh, acting in the best interest of the land and creation, uh, especially with the um, changes through the Indian Act and in our governance systems where we're electing, you know, everybody looks at, uh, First Nations and thinks it's, there's a democracy happening there. There isn't. There isn't a platform that somebody runs on like, I can't move to another reserve if I want to uh, be in a different election. Well, I guess I could with a lot of red hoops or Indian affairs. But uh, uh, in, our, in our communities, we have a set number of people. We have a band list. So 3,000 members on a reserve, 1,500 are kids, 1,500 are band members that's your voting population and it doesn't change. So if those voting families, if a voting family has three to 400 votes, they control who is going to be chief and council every single time. How is that democracy? So then you're seeing that split from what we're supposed to be teaching our children, what we're supposed to be telling to our communities, what we're supposed to be upholding to this adaption or adoption into the Canadian uh, political system, into thinking like capitalists. You see a lot of chiefs nowadays talking about economic reconciliation and things like that, buying shares in oil and gas companies because um, they're not chiefs. They're not um, trained governance leaders the way we had the, uh, the chiefs of old or the chiefs of past. They're uh, a product, uh, they're Indian Act chiefs. They're a product of, uh, what colonization has done to our communities. And that's why we have our people failing to fight harder for the climate and to stop these kinds of things from happening. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the result of uh, what Canada has put our people through. They've broken our people and it's the sad reality is that there's a handful of people standing trying to fight and remember uh, the teachings and the guidance that we had. It's, it's a commentary on how broken the people are, the system is, because in 10,000 years, we didn't have a lot of wildfires. In 10,000 years, we didn't uh, destroy the waterways and uh, pollute the air and do the things. Canadians, Canada's only been here for 150 years and they've managed to destroy everything in that time. Well, I guess that's what you, I guess that's what they call progress. Thank you, Rachel. Melanie. Yeah, thanks. I, I think uh, to, I mentioned it earlier around a sense of urgency. I think that was probably the most challenging um, part for me in politics that uh, Indigenous people, Rachel just mentioned the last 150 years, it wasn't a long time, but the impact that we've had, the negative impact we've had on Mother Earth in the last 150 years has been um, devastating. And 
when it comes to public policy and moving the dial and creating that sense of action, which is why we talk about the truth and reconciliations calls to action. It's not a truth and reconciliation call to advisory or a truth and reconciliation call to a report with recommendations. It's get on with it. What's the action plan? Um, I, I think it's interesting that you, you mentioned, um, you know, Canada being on fire. I, I think the literary uh, example there is what you heard from Rachel. Um, there, we are in the middle of a crisis and it's gonna take guts, political guts to move the dial. I'm not gonna tell you how politics works. We don't have time for this, but we know that a lot of politics is about polling. We know that it's about who, who votes and who doesn't vote. And we know that Mother Earth doesn't vote. We know that children don't vote. We know that they don't get a say in their next generation, but they're deeply concerned. Uh, the generation that has been able to see the last hundred years have, have witnessed enough and they want action. They want political will and guts uh, to make change. So I, I guess I would say from uh, a National Indigenous uh, Day of Celebration, Indigenous people, um, I, I was the former Minister for Advanced Education, Skills and Training. I always refer to acronyms like STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Math. Indigenous people have, are the traditional healers, learners. We have protected this land since time of memorial. We know what it takes to get the job done, but that's why I'm being facetious about the advisory stuff. We take on one token native, put them at the table, represent all the nations that Rachel just described are not homogeneous. We put all the weight on that person's shoulder as though they're supposed to be the voice for the people, but that voice doesn't have the power to make the change. The public policy comes from treasury board. The public policy comes from the public, the electorate voting, standing up and saying, we want something done now. It, so I, I going to stop there um, by hopefully inspiring you to get out and vote because that is what unfortunately we're not going to change the structures at the moment but the more we can push government to act with that urgency that's what's going to get the change okay um we do have some um oh actually i think robin um we're going to go straight to audience questions. Okay. Uh, given the time, I think we're going to um, move on to some audience questions. Um, and uh, Joan, I'm sure this has probably come up in the campaign, but it, it's come up in the questions from our audience here. And that is um, just, uh, I, I think, people wanting to know from your perspective how you balance um, your relationship with the, with the BCNDP that you're running for and their support of the pipeline through what's that's in territory. Um, like how does one navigate those kind of difficult questions? It's, it's, I know something Melanie's dealt with, I dealt with it. It's always a very hard thing to do. Um, so just your, your observation on that, I'm sure it's come up in the campaign. One of the things um, my elders uh, taught me was that when, when you get an entire pie taken from you, and that's what's happened here, really. He said that we don't have to take it back one huge gulp at a time. He says, we'll get it back one slice at a time. So long as it moves us towards owning and taking control of the entire pie again. Because as, um, Grandpa Dan has said, everything was taken from us, including our authority. There has been um, uh, legislation which has, um, which is slowly moving us towards us taking back that authority. In Delgamook, it recognized our undeniable um, sharing of the jurisdiction over the land and an undeniable economic component to that. And it's up to us as Indigenous peoples to compel governments to move towards that. But when I, I thought about those fires, um, we are the ones that stewarded the land, as um, Melanie has said, and we need to take, uh, I think, 
people are getting to the point where they said, okay, there's indigenous peoples that stewarded this land for hundreds of thousands of years without the catastrophic flooding and mudslides and the, and the fires that are taking place. Let's look to them to uh, assist us in, in making the world a better place because right now it is a mess and we need um, everybody to realize that we're the ones with the 20,000 years of knowledge there in order to, to make the world a better place. Thank you, John. Uh, um, uh, we're getting near the end, but we have one last question, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, ask you all, we'll do the, the lightning round now, I'll ask you all to give a 30-second answer on this one, but um, um, I just came back from the second meeting of the UN Permanent Forum on People of African Descent in New York, where one of the main goals discussed is to establish a UN Declaration on the Rights of People of African Descent. So. Given Indigenous people's 15-year experience with the uh, UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, would you advise us Black folks to go for it? And I want to point out one thing. The um, Canada voted against the creation of the UN Permanent Forum on People of African Descent, just like they voted against the UNDRIP. So let's go, Joan, Melanie, and we'll finish with Rachel. <laughs> Absolutely, I would because it gives us something to shoot at. It gives us um, something for them to say, look, you made a commitment to support this. Now you're going to, uh, we have to hold their feet to the fire. And really it's, uh, like I said, it's not just a matter of say, oh, oh gee, we're really sorry and, and we'll do this, that and the other. If they're not doing it, let's put their feet to the fire and say, look, you made this promise and you're going to do it. And so I would never um, not say, let's, let's not do that. They won't, they won't uh, live up to it. Well, we're going to make them live up to what they've already promised. All right. Thank you, Joan. So Billy. Do this together. I yeah. know that Rachel's going to disagree with me, and I I respect her self determination because um, I saw her body language. I will say that for me, part of public policy and getting into politics is not. It was never about making it perfect, but it was about moving the dial into a direction that was going to be more positive, that was going to be rooted in self determination. I spoke to uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People in the Legislative Assembly in October. 31st, 2019, those were the days that mattered to my ancestors to stand there as a First Nations woman to say that we recognize the rights of Indigenous people and as the framework, that to me is better than voting for the Indian Act. I wasn't a part of that, but I'm the generation that's going to be a part of trying to dismantle these systems. So my advice for the African people who there are very many a lot of parallels in, in Turtle Island about what have happened to our people. I respect right, uh, your right to self-determination, but a framework that holds a government to have that, um, that template is to me more than nothing. And, and that's why I would support, um, support your community in, in pursuing that, that act, that legislation. I always said that legislation trumps policy. And any legislation that up, upholds oppressed people's rights, to me, is the direction that we need to go. Thank you. And Rachel? I completely disagree. I think that uh, if, uh, the, if this came to pass, uh, the same they follow the same route because uh, what Canada has done is they've turned it into an aspirational document. Uh, even the... Uh, um, DRIPA, which is in uh, the BC document that's being discussed, uh, even in its first court case out, they only looked at it as a, a guiding, uh, with guiding principles. So you can't give uh, your life or your information into the hands of the oppressor and expect them to be fair. Legislation uh, is adversarial. The court system is adversarial. Our system of consensus building, of being inclusive, 
including the land, the waters and the animals in our discussions, that is what is, what is better. It's consensus building, it's on the ground, it's gonna save us. And one last thing that I wanted to say is, um, it's not about timeliness because uh, when you go down the journey of First Nation people, when you go into your, the thinking that we have, uh, the thinking that we have because it's philosophical and related to spirituality, it's not about time. I'm doing what I can now and I'm training my kids and my grandkids to follow through because my role may not be to fix it, but my role will be to remember what was given to us and continue that line on the line of my leaders, the hereditary lines and the lines that will keep us who we are as Indigenous people on this land. And today, uh, the people that I know, the elders and my late father, they wanted this to be a day of prayer because that's what we are about. We are about spirituality at the end of the day, and that doesn't fit in any document. Thank you very much. Libby. Well, I, we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we had a very lively discussion today, very important discussion, different perspectives, which is always okay. It's always good. Um, and I want to thank each of our panelists, um, Joan Phillip, Rachel Snow, and Melanie Mark for being with us today, on, especially because it is um, Indigenous uh, National Day here in Canada. And um, I just want to thank Rebel for allowing this space um, that we can have these kinds of discussions. Uh, just to let you know that uh, our live political panel off the hill will return in September. So be sure to get an invitation for that event by signing up to Rebel's newsletter at rebel.ca slash subscribe. Uh, so thank you to everybody for, for being here tonight. Um, and we'll see you again in September. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.